Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the eighth annual Trudy Sundberg Lectures. It's so great to see so many familiar faces, and we're excited to have Wade Davis. And we also want to extend a warm welcome to his wife, Gail Percy, an anthropologist who's also with us tonight. I am Jan Sundberg Witsit, one of Trudy's four children. Some of you knew Trudy, but for those of you who didn't, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background about Trudy. First and foremost, she was a teacher for almost 40 years, and she loved every single minute of it. She made lifelong friends with many of her students. She mentored many of them, and many of them stayed in touch with her, including taking long road trips from where they lived in Los Angeles to visit her on Whidbey Island every summer to talk Shakespeare, books, movies, and literature. She was a lifelong learner, had an insatiable curiosity. She read every single day. She loved books and libraries and talking about ideas. She was a champion of the downtrodden, especially when they were young people. She sought them out and found a way to mentor or find mentors for them. She was an author, a playwright, and a journalist. She was a community activist before that word was, that label was even invented or before it was cool. And she created think tanks to try to address local issues and problems. And then she took action. She was only five foot three, but you had to stand out of her way because she enlisted everyone she could find to help her solve a problem in the community. She was a lover of nature and a master swimmer who got up every morning at 5 a.m. to swim a mile in the public pool, and the Navy SEALs who trained there saved a lane for her every morning and called her the shark. <laughs> she was a devoted friend and mother and grandmother. When she died, the lecture series was created in her honor by her friends, family, and former students who wanted to find a way to keep her spirit alive and in a way that represented all of the things that she stood for. And because she cared so much about the Whidbey community, they thought it needed to be something where the community would be involved with it. So over the last eight years, we featured topics on income inequality, climate change, women who changed America, the pediatrician who broke the crisis of the lead in the water in Flint, Michigan, and the director of the Hubble tele Telescope, to name just a few. Right now, I'd like to ask Dr. Marshall Goldberg to please stand up, and all of the Trudy Planning Committee members who are in here to stand up. <laughs> Although it took a village and two years of fundraising and hard work just to get the lecture series organized enough to become a nonprofit and off the ground, the lectures really are the brainchild of Dr. Marshall Goldberg, who is one of Trudy's dear friends and involved in many of her discussion groups and think tanks. Little did he know that when he retired from being a physician, it would become his full-time job <laughs> year round. The committee members are all volunteers from the community, except those who are on staff with the Snow Isle Libraries. They all work tirelessly year-round to bring these lectures to Whidbey Island. Wade gave a lecture this afternoon at South Whidbey High School. And so for just a minute, I want you to listen to some housekeeping instructions and pretend you're students. First of all, you should have gotten a blank card when you came in, and maybe a pencil, so that you could jot down questions during Wade's talk, and we'll try to get him to answer as many as we can at the end of the lecture. Also, if you want to support the lectures in the future, you can pick up a donation envelope when you exit in the lobby, or you can use, and this is very high tech, the QR code on your program. <clears throat> These events could not happen without the support of the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation. The Snow Isle Libraries system has 23 branches 
throughout Snohomish and Island County. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you now the new executive director for the Snow Isle Library Foundation, our dear partner, Christina Corteva, and she'll tell you a little bit more about the work that they're doing. Good evening, everyone. I am Christina Corteva, Executive Director of the Snow Owl Libraries Foundation. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight at this beautiful venue and welcome you to the 2022 Trudy Sandberg Lecture Series. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Trudy, but over the last few months, I had an opportunity to meet some of her close friends and family. And it immediately became clear that she, is someone, she was someone extraordinary whose passion, kindness, and love of community touched the lives of everyone she met. Trudy's lifelong commitment to discover, explore, and exchange ideas and opinions in an environment of respect and consideration beautifully exemplifies all that our public libraries stand for. The Snow Libraries Foundation is honored to co-present this lecture series and help carry on Trudy's legacy. And in times of record high bans on books and ideas and attacks on core human rights, I think that the role of public libraries and educational forums like this one, where we can freely and openly exchange ideas, is especially relevant. I wanted to use this opportunity and thank everyone here in this room who helped support the Snow Libraries Foundation during our recent fundraising campaigns, uh, Library Giving Day and Give Big. We were overwhelmed by the generosity of the Whidbey Island community. Thank you so much. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Snow Owl Libraries Foundation, we are the fundraising arm of the Snow Owl Libraries system. We help fund innovative programs in 23 library locations in Snohomish and Island counties. Whether promoting literacy and love of reading through programs like third graders read together and Whidbey reads, Introducing innovative services like our express walkers, which provide 24-hour library access. Enhancing the library collection, bringing the library to the doorsteps of seniors and people with disabilities, or providing supplemental funding for important capital improvements, such as the upcoming renovation of your community library right here in Langley. The role of the foundation is to help support our libraries so they can continue to be accessible to everyone. If you'd like to learn more about the work of the foundation or how you can get involved, please visit our website. We count on you to continue to be ambassadors for free access to information, lifelong learning, and intellectual freedom by supporting your libraries and programs like this. Thank you again for joining us tonight. And before I pass it on to Jen, Let's give another round of applause to Marshall Goldberg and the amazing Trudy Sandberg Lecture Committee. They all did a phenomenal job in making tonight's event happen. Enjoy the evening. Every year, we ask somebody who knew Trudy to deliver a five-minute Trudy tribute. Each one has been incredibly special and often a real highlight of the evening. This year, the lucky person is Gary, Dr. Gary Berner. Gary was a classmate of mine at Oak Harbor Junior High, Oak Harbor High School. He was a talented high school wrestler and football player. He was a whiz at science and math, and I have to say, helped me out in those classes. And he went on to become a favorite dentist on Whidbey Island. In addition, as if he didn't have enough to do, he decided to take up glass blowing 17 years ago. And in honor of Trudy and the special event tonight, he made this vase sitting on the table. So without further ado, here's Gary. And I know he'll have some good stories. Thank you for those kind words, Jan. And good evening, everybody. I believe that a major portion of my success is really due to the, the, the fortunate to have the mentors that I've had in my life. And the, so a mentor is someone who just 
teaches you and guides you and sets examples for you for that. And there's so many through coaching, teaching, advisors, um, dentists who are just always willing to share the reason for their success. But the very first mentor and the longest tenure was Mrs. Sunberg. It took me a long time to call her Trudy. She was always a Mrs. Sunberg to me. So it was in the eighth grade as an English teacher. And after I was tasked with doing this, I'm trying to figure out what did, why did she take me under her wing like that? But Jan, you just explained it. You know, it's, she must have thought I was one of the downtrodden. <laughs> it, that, that year was a really a difficult year for me. So it's 14 years of age and my father was in the US Navy and we'd lived for five years in San Diego, and all of a sudden I'm uprooted and have to come to Whidbey Island. And I remember asking him, why couldn't I just stay there? It was Beach Boar era, and I was on the beach. It was, but, he, but here I am, and now I wouldn't trade, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, as I said, I didn't know what motivated her to take me under that, that her wing and foster me like that, but I, I do remember that she liked to keep score for wrestling matches, so I think that was part of it. But anyway, I have a um, story about that year that I'm gonna share towards the end of this. I recently, um, as I was going through this, I went and looked in her chart and I found a, a whole bunch of notes that she had written me over the years, and so I was going to share a couple of those with you. Um, I always knew I was going to get a reading list, and the next time I was going to get have to give a book report to her. Um, so here's just an example of some. Of, this is like a birthday, happy belated birthday homework assignment inside. Lots of books. It's another one, book recommendations for Gary Berner. And under it says, your teacher, TJS, have fun. So I, I discovered that some of those books I never did read. So I have to tell you, I probably own every one of them now. And I'm looking forward to trying to find out what was so special about that book that she recommended it to me. So, so yesterday at, I was at a meeting and I had Cleopatra and my friends go like, Cleopatra, really? <laughs> so I had to tell the whole story about Trudy. Anyway, so um, one of the notes, I, I guess I had written her a note, and she said to me, I'm going to read this. Um, she said that she would frame the message that I'd sent her if I would frame the um, comments that she wrote on my editorial. So she's still grading my efforts, right? So what she had written on there was per aspera ad astra, which I had to look up, and it said it means through hardships to the stars. So it kind of is like what you said, Jan, just echoes what she said. So she must have thought I had some hardships there. But anyway, she's in there. She said your lifestyle was a reflection on your early talents and mentioned my appreciation of literature. I don't think I would ever describe myself that way, but I was sure happy to read that. There was a long hiatus in our relationship. I think, Jan, you guys moved away in school, and um, most of my contact was with your dad, John, with fishing, so I, I was just lucky to get invited, so I always kind of got a little catch up with her. But then she um, chose me to be her dentist. Well, we had an office rule that that I had to have uninterrupted time with her like four times more than anybody else because I knew I had questions to answer. And as we were talking about, she would challenge you to, to think. And I think one thing missing in our world is, is that discourse that you can have with somebody in a reasonable way and even disagree but not be disagreeable about it. So I looked forward to her challenges every time. Um, I actually um, had to keep a dictionary standby because there's a word here that I, I still stumble over and I've never seen it used ever, but it's, she signed this note 
Sempe eternally yours, Trudy. So I looked up, what does that mean? It means eternal, unchanging, and everlasting. So another, I knew copiously, I didn't have to look that one up, but then she called me Renaissance man. I had no idea what that was. But I kind of like that she thought that about me. So, I think that um, I disappointed her a couple times in her life because she could never get me to be a, uh, a poetry person. And she told me once that the only reason you should read is to further your wisdom. But I, I, I told her I read to escape sometimes. I think the last time, one of the last times I saw her, she, as she walked into the operatory, she says, now our last project we have to do is to fix this global warming stuff. So she was just on fire about it. Marshall early on asked me if I attended her memorial and I, um, I told him that I was out working in the garden and I had this sudden thought that it was today so I ran in and got cleaned up and showered and raced into town so afraid I'd be late, only to discover that I was a week early. <laughs> well, when I went to that memorial, I mean, she always made me feel like the most special person in the world. And I walked in there and there was like 500 other people who felt the same way. And I think that really is measure of Trudy Sunbrook that she made everybody else around her feel good. So I'm going to go back to the story now from that eighth grade year. So this, this happened at a time when um, somebody that we had gone to high school with had been um, convicted of serial murders. And for some reason, I was on a list to um, testify at his mitigation trial. And I was, you know, I didn't want to do it, and I was really trying to think of what was I going to do with this when Trudy comes and brings me an essay I wrote in the eighth grade. It was about the death penalty. And I remember that thinking when she did that, what, you know, I hadn't, what did I write? Did I research this? Did I just do it to please her? Um, what, what did I think was going on? And it, and how did she know that I was in this dilemma about having to testify about somebody that I'd known from as a child? And did I still even believe what I wrote in the eighth grade? But the most amazing thing about that is I've talked to lots of other teachers, and they all tell me I never keep work from a student. But she not only kept it, she could find it and, and brought it to me at the most opportune time. Now, I think that was the last time I disappointed her because um, I, I, I remember asking the attorney, he said, ask me if I believe in the death penalty. And, and I said, no, for all the reasons that were in that deal. But I said, you know, killing 16 people, maybe. So they didn't ask me and I got out of it. So, so, um, so on reflection, if I had a chance to write her one more note, I would as, you know, when you have a big word, it's like you have to try to use it again. So I would say, uh, I did this for you tonight, Trudy. Except eternally yours, Gary. Thanks. For anybody who knew Trudy, uh, even though we were a Navy family that moved all the time, it's miraculous that she had files and filing cabinets and drawers full of papers and carbon copies of letters and notes and birthday cards, and she could find it in a second. I mean, it, we still can't get over it. Anyway, now it's time for the main attraction. And just the introduction of Wade Davis is really like taking a virtual trip around the world. Wade is an ethnographer, an author, photographer, filmmaker. His adventures have taken him from, now just focus on this, and this is only part of his adventures. 
the Arctic to Africa, the Amazon to Australia, Peru to Polynesia, Tibet to Togo, and Borneo to Colombia, just to name a few. He was an explorer in residence at National Geographic from 2000 to 2013. Who wouldn't want that job description? Um, he is a professor of anthropology and the British Columbia Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. Wade has degrees in anthropology and biology and received his PhD in ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. He spent three years in the Amazon and the Andes as a plant explorer living among 15 indigenous groups in eight Latin American nations while making 6,000 botanical collections. He has published over 300 scientific and popular articles, written 23 books, including The Wayfinders, which takes us on a thrilling journey to celebrate the wisdom of the world's indigenous cultures and what he will be talking about tonight. He has made over a dozen documentaries, including, and I'm gonna try not to ruin this, Wade, El Sendero de la Anaconda, a 90-minute feature documentary shot in the Northwest Amazon and now available on Netflix. National Geographic calls him one of the explorers of the millennium. He has been described as a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. I first heard Wade speak about 15 or 20 years ago at an event for Conservation International and he blew my mind, and I've never forgotten it. And so when the committee was putting out names to decide who would be our next speaker, I brought up Wade's name, and everybody was really excited about the possibility. So we had been communicating, texting, calling for about 15 months, and um, I think you'll be as captivated as I was 15 or 20 years ago. It's my great pleasure to introduce Wade Davis. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I'm a little new to the cult of Trudy, um, but I think if, uh, if the spirit of a, of a woman can transcend the generations and become embedded in the heart of a daughter, I think uh, she's right there sitting beside us tonight. They even, I discovered today they even look I, the, the same, and I think you're exactly like your mom in so many ways, so bless you and thanks for, for having me. It's great to be with you, and Yori, I'm so happy. This is one of my dear friends, just the best bagpiper in the world I want to introduce you to. Uh, I mean, we go to a place called Bohemian Grove together, and he wakes me up in the redwoods every dawn, so it's just wonderful to be with him and his wife and the two little boys, who already speak Spanish, by the way, right? There you go. Anyway, um, you know, one of the um, great delights of travel as you've no doubt experienced, is the opportunity to spend time amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel the past in the wind, touch it in the stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that as we sit here tonight in the Amazon, jaguar shaman still journey beyond the Milky Way. And in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning and the, in the high Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma. Just to know that is to realize the central revelation of anthropology. And that is the idea that the world into which we are born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality. The consequence of one set of adaptive choices that our cultural lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti a yak herder on the slopes of Chomalungma, Mount Everest, an eagle hunter in Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof nomad in Mongolia. All of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of thinking, other ways of being, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And that's an idea that if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now together, 
the myriad of cultures of the world make up a social web of life that envelops the planet and is as important as the biological web of life that you know so well as a biosphere. And in an early book, I, I coined the term ethnosphere for this social web of life. I try to create an organizing principle, and I defined the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and ideas, myths and memories, intuitions and inspirations brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and innovative species. And just as the biosphere is under assault with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere. But if anything, at a far greater rate, no biologist, for example, would dare suggest that 50% of all plants and animals are moribund, because it simply isn't true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When each of you were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language isn't just grammar and vocabulary. It's a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the mature world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social, spiritual possibilities. And by complete academic consensus amongst linguists of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that we were born, fully half aren't being taught to children, which means they're on the brink of exhaustion. Now, there are many people who say, wouldn't, wouldn't the world be a greater place, a more integrated place, if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? And my answer to that is always to say, what a great idea. But let's make that universal language in Uptatak. Let's make it Yoruba. Let's make it Haida. Let's make it Tibetan. Let's make it Mandarin, whatever. And suddenly you begin to feel, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet that dreadful plight is indeed the fate of somebody somewhere on Earth roughly every two weeks. Because on average, every fortnight, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now, this doesn't have to happen. And the reason it's so poignant is that it's also unfolding in the very generation in which science has finally proved the philosophers to be true. We really are all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, literally, studies through genetics have revealed without doubt that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race is an utter fiction. We're all cut from the same genetic cloth. In fact, we're all descendants of, the, of Africa including those of us who walked out of the ancient continent some 65,000 years ago and then embarked on this incredible hegira, 40,000 years, 2,500 human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But if we're cut from the same genetic cloth, here's a really interesting revelation. It means by definition that every culture shares the same mental acuity, the same raw intellectual capacity, and critically, whether that genius is invested in technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement of the West, or placed instead in the deserts of Australia into the challenge of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the realm of culture. That old Victorian idea that we went from the savage to the barbarian the civilized of the Strand of London, with European society at the apex of the pyramid that went down the sides of the so-called primitives of the world, has absolutely been debunked by modern science, reduced to a vestige of the 19th century as irrelevant to our lives today, and as distant from those lives as notions that clergymen had in that distant century that the earth was but 6,000 years old. And this stunning affirmation of the human spirit Science has come to the fore to prove the essential connectivity of our human family. And what this really means, then, is that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being modern. They're not failed attempts at being us. 
Every culture, by definition, is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer this question, they do so in the 7,000 different voices of humanity. And those answers collectively become our kind of human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us in the coming centuries. This is the central lesson of anthropology. Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. The purpose of anthropology, as Franz Boas's great acolyte, Ruth Benedict, said, is simply to make the world safe for human differences. Anthropology is the enemy of hate. It's the enemy of conceit. It's a power, it's a power of the poetry of the human spirit. But the question becomes, what do we do about it? You know, if you're a biologist, Jane Goodall or Sylvia Earle or other colleagues of mine at the Geographic, you identify an area of high biological endemism, you can protect it. You create a protected area. But you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't preserve culture. We preserve jam, not people. Culture is dynamic, ever-changing. Every people, every culture is dancing always with new possibilities for life. So when I was recruited to the National Geographic in 2000, charged with the mission of changing the way the world views and values culture in a decade, a typically humble assignment from the National Geographic, um, what were we to do? We knew that polemics were never persuasive. We knew politicians followed, they didn't lead. But we realized that storytellers could change the world. And so what I decided to do was to set out on a series of journeys, if you will, to the ethnosphere, not to celebrate the exoticism of the other, as so many ethnographic films do, but to go to those places in the realm of culture where the practices were so dazzling, so amazing, that our huge global audience couldn't help but come away impressed by the wonder of the human spirit as brought into being by culture. And so we began that series of expeditions in the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination. And that, of course, was Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the southern sea. And I was invited to sail on the Hokalea, this recreated catamaran, the emblem of the Renaissance of Polynesia, reconstructed based on the, the drawings that Joseph Bank did as he sailed across the Pacific with Captain Cook. And with the Polynesian Voyaging Society, we sailed into the open ocean. Now, these are sailors who even today can sense the presence of distant atolls beyond the visible horizon just by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel. These are sailors who, in the darkness of the hull of the vessel, can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the canoe, distinguishing those caused by local weather patterns from the deep currents that pulsate across the Pacific and be could follow with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer could follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But here's the real secret. It was all based on dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning means you only know where you are by remembering precisely how you got there. And it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning on a long oceanic voyage that kept most European sailors hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesians from an ancient civilization called Lapita, off the shores of New Guinea and New Caledonia, set sail into the rising sun. Within a thousand years, they had reached Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and then the diaspora stopped for 10 centuries. But then when it, on, it went on 4,000 kilometers across to the Marquesas, northwest to Hawaii, southeast to Rapa Nui, and eventually around the time of the First Crusade to Eotearoa, what we now call New Zealand. But here's the amazing thing. After the civilization left Samoa Tonga, in that hiatus, they had lost the written word. And that meant that to sail forward using dead reckoning, the wayfinder, in a tradition that lacked a written word at this point, had to remember every sign of the sun, the moon, 
the stars, the salinity of the water, the wind, every sign of the natural world, and not only remember in detail, but also the order of the acquisition. And if that stream of knowledge broke, the journey could end in disaster. And that is how the Polynesians settled the greatest ocean on Earth. And Hokulea still sails. We've now started a new journey. It sailed around the world. Now we're doing the biggest journey of all. We're circumnavigating the entire Pacific um, uh, as a journey of kind of celebration and cultural revitalization. OK, let's go from the greatest ocean into the greatest forest, the Amazon, a forest the size of the continental United States, more poetically put, the face of the full moon. We enter the homeland of a people like the Barasana, the Makuna, the Tanimuka, the peoples of the Anaconda who believe that they originated in the belly of the sacred serpent that came up the Milk River from the east to regurgitate the peoples on the various flanks of the Northwest Amazon, a people who cognitively do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the forest is equated to the canopy of the heavens. Or if we come down the Andean Cordillera into the eastern forests of Ecuador, we enter the land of the Auca, as they were known, pejorative term in Quechua meaning savage. Their real name is Warani, the people. And one of the extraordinary things about the Warani is they were first peacefully contacted in 1958, five years after I was born. In 1957, five missionaries made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glossy photographs of themselves in what we would say to be friendly gestures, forgetting that the people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. So they picked up the photographs from the forest floor, looked behind the face to try to find the form to the figure, found nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, and they promptly speared the five missionaries to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders, they speared each other. We traced genealogies back eight generations and found out that 54% of their mortality for men was intertribal spearing raids in a kind of Hatfield McCoy blood feud uh, scenario. But they had, nevertheless, a perspicacious knowledge of the forest that was incredible. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what form of life had left it behind. Again, not because they were sauvage, but in some kind of Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who paid attention to the world around them, a forest upon which their lives depended. And it's precisely that precision, that perspicacity, that gave rise to these extraordinary preparations like this one. Karari, the flying death, derived from 90 different species of Amazonian plants, including a drug, of course, detubo curarin, which revolutionized surgery when introduced in the 1940s. And this attention, the lens, if you will, of their interaction with the flora of their homeland of course, brings us directly <clears throat> into the domain of the shaman. Now, if you follow the work of legendary American anthropologists like Shirley MacLaine, uh, you would think that the shaman is kind of a grandfather figure with bells and whistles who hums a lot. I've been with shaman all my life. I've never been with one who wasn't psychotic. That's their job. They're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. They're the ones who go on these spaces because the essence of the shamanic art of healing is a notion that disease is not defined by the presence or absence of pathogens alone, but as a state of imbalance in which the individual is susceptible to malicious forces. And so the essential act of shamanic healing is one in which the shaman must invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance, to get in these distant realms where he or she can work their deeds of medical, magical rescue. And that accounts for one of the curious anomalies in botanical science of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants, 95% are from the Americas. Not because the forests of West Africa or equatorial Southeast Asia were depauperate, but people there had other avenues to the divine. In the Amazon, the route to the Godhead was always mediated by these curious hallucinogenic plants, like this one in a photograph taken by my great mentor, the greatest Amazonian explorer of the 20th century, Richard Evans Schultes, amongst the Yanomami in the 1950s. They're blowing up their nose, something called Ebene, the semen of the sun, 
derived from the blood red resin of several species in the genus Virola in the nutmeg family. These powders are chock full of dimethyltryptamine, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. Di to have this stuff blown up your nose is like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. It creates not the distortion of reality, it creates a disillusion of reality completely. But it's not just the dazzling pharmacological effects that interest us, but what these plants tell us about a different way of knowing. You've all heard, I'm sure, of ayahuasca, this legendary preparation of the Northwest Amazon. And that's just what it is. It's a preparation, a combination of plants. Now, the reason the Yanomami blow that stuff up their nose is tryptamines are orally inactive. You can't take them through the mouth because they're denatured by an enzyme found in the human stomach called monoamine oxidase. You can only take them orally if you take them in conjunction with some other compound that momentarily denatures the enzyme in the human gut. And this is where it gets interesting. The ayahuasca is the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family full of these tryptamines, but also the woody liana in a completely different group of plants that has within its bark beta carbolines, which are MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines in the leaves. So here's the obvious question. How, in a flora of 80,000 species of vascular plants, did the shaman learn to combine these morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest to create what is essentially a, bio, a kind of a biochemical version of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts? Our only scientific explanation is trial and error, which is statistically quickly reduced to a meaningless euphemism. You ask the Indians, and they say the plants teach us. What does that mean? When Schultes was with the Siona Sequoia in 1941, he discovered 17 folk varieties of this woody liana, all of which were referable to his Harvard-trained taxonomic mind as being the same species. He asked the Indians what was the nature of their classification. They looked at him as he was a fool, because anyone who knew anything about plants would know that you took each of the 17 on, on a night of a full moon, and each species or variety sank you in a different key. Well, that's not going to get you a PhD at Harvard, but it's more interesting than counting flower parts. And it creates an idea of another way of knowing. And this is the realm of the shaman. And in the Northwest Amazon, these societies that we now know are the descendants of the ancient civilizations that Aureliana saw when he went down the Amazon for the first time in 1535. These, these societies today have, have belief systems that, that uh, are extraordinary. Their most profound conviction is that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. They, they believe that they are the absolute stewards of the land. They, they believe that they only human beings bring order to existence. They have social structures that facil facilitate exchange and peace, not war, not the least of which is a marriage rule, that you must marry someone who speaks a different language. So in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a different tongue. They simply wait, watch, listen, and one day begin to speak. Now, these, these ideas of the relationship between the natural world I think are very important. You know, we, our way of thinking is dominant, but it doesn't imply that it's the norm. And in our particular intellectual tradition, as you all know, when we try to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith uh, in the Renaissance and into the Enlightenment, when Descartes famously said that all that exists is mind and matter, in a single gesture he deanimated the world and swept away all notions of myth, magic, myth, but essentially metaphor. And he deanimated the world, and, in, and the world became just sort of a stage set upon which the human drama unfolded. That way of thinking, nothing wrong with it, but it is highly anomalous. Most societies around the world base their relationship with the natural world not on a kind of extractive model, but on a reciprocal model. Some basic iteration of the fact that the earth owes its bounty to humans, humans in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. And this is why we speak of the concept of sacred geography. Now, I was raised in British Columbia to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock ready to be mined. I worked in logging camps all my life. We saw the forest as mere cellulose and board feet. Now, that 
made me profoundly different than my godchildren in Peru raised to believe that a mountain is Apu deity that will direct their destiny, or for that matter, the Kwakwakawak or the Haida on the coast of British Columbia raised to believe that those forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibal spirits that would be embraced during the Hamut's initiation. And the point is not who's right and who's wrong, who cares? But if you believe the mountain is a deity, you'll have a different relationship to it than if you believe that it's simply a pile of rock. And the ecological footprint of your community consequentially will be profoundly different. And these ideas, these intuitions play out in ritual, no more dramatically than the Andes of Peru. For over 40 years, well, I should just mention my favorite plant, coca, the divine leaf of immortality, the source of cocaine, Coca is to cocaine what potatoes are to vodka. There's no correlation whatsoever. We did the first nutritional study for the USDA and the DEA in the 1970s, and what we found out horrified them. Coca has, yes, a small amount of cocaine in it, absorbed benignly in the mucous membrane of the mouth, much more benignly than, say, the caffeine in your coffee bean. But the plant also was full of vitamins, so the daily consumption of Leaves satisfy all the dietary requirements. More calcium than any plant studied by science, which made it perfect for a diet that lacked a dairy product. Enzymes, which enhance the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, perfect for the potato-based diet of the Andes. This is a plant that has been used for 10,000 years with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, uh, in the entire Andean region. And this is a plant that we remain tormented by cocaine, are now in the process of trying to eradicate instead of coming to terms with the difference between a sacred leaf and a horrible drug. But in the Andes, the use of coca is sublime. You salute the Apu deities. You embrace the mountain. And they do so through ritual. In Chinchero, which is a beautiful community outside of Cusco, once each year, the fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. He puts on the clothing of his sister or his mother. He becomes a wailaka. And as a wailaka, he must lead the banners of all able-bodied men on a run. But it's not your ordinary run. You start off at 11,500 feet, run down 3,000 feet, and then run to 16,000 feet, cross two soaring Andean ridges over the course of a long ritual day, which is lesser run than an ordeal. And the idea is that through sacrifice, which means in Latin to make sacred, you once again take ownership and responsibility of the land of your community. I did this run at the age of 48, the oldest man ever to do it, the only outsider to ever do it. And I only got through the day, as Gail will tell you, by chewing more coca leaves in one day than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the plant. But, but these local rituals become Pan-Andean when the Pleiades reemerge in the sky, 50,000 indigenous people from all over the Andes come to a sacred valley of the Sinicata, where a vision of the Christ was seen at the time of the conquest. They bring their crosses from their communities on their backs up this pilgrimage, and then they plant the crosses in the ice in the shadow of Osangati to absorb the power of Pachamama. And after three days, they are taken off the mountain down into the valley itself. This is a perfect expression of the syncretic reality of modern Andean South America. 500 years of Catholic faith on top of centuries of pre-Columbian intuitions. But there is one place in South America where the pre-Columbian voice remains heard unfettered. And that is in the isolated volcanic massif of the Sierra de, Bar de Santa Marta, which soars to 20,000 feet out of the coastal Caribbean plain of Colombia, the highest coastal mountain range on earth, which remains the domain of the elder brothers. Three tribes, Wiwa, Conquano, actually four, Conquano, Arawako, and Kogi, all descendants of the ancient Tyrone civilization. In the wake of the conquest, they retreated into this mountain, and they reinvented themselves as a devotional culture of peace. This is a wonderful story. I, I was in my office at the National Geographic, when the Colombian ambassador, Carolina Barco, walked in with three mamos in the winter. They don't wear shoes, so they're barefoot in the winter in Washington. 
and this political leader, Danilo Villafania. And as they were pitching me on the idea for a film, they're very hip and very organized. Um, I looked at Danilo and I said, I don't, I don't mean to be rude, but you look like an old friend of mine. And I pulled out a photograph of his father, Adalberto, who had been murdered by the Paracos, the paramilitary in Colombia. And I said, Danilo, you don't remember, but when you were an infant, I carried you on my back for three months with your dad up and down the mountains. He was so touched that he, he agreed to what I'd always hoped, the journey to the heart of the world. You see, they are still ruled by a ritual priesthood. The training for the priesthood involves 18 years, two nine years of initiation, most of the time in the shadowy realm of darkness, where the, where the priests-to-be do not see women, ritual diet, they do not see a horizon, they do not see a sunrise. And for that entire time, they're enculturated into a belief system that maintains that their beliefs and prayers literally maintain the cosmic balance of the world. And then they're taken out and led on a journey from the hut to the ice, from the ice to the sea, back to the hut, a journey to the heart of the world. This had been rumored in anthropology, but no one had ever witnessed it. And I was able to take a film crew from the National Geographic, and we made a journey. And every, every ripple on the landscape um, resonates with mythological significance. And at the penultimate state of the pilgrimage, we found the Mamos in a circle, and they were moving their fingers like this because their thoughts are as threads. So metaphor is a loom. They describe their movements up and down the mountains of threads. So over the course of a lifetime, you weave a piece of cloth over the body of the earth. When they plant a garden, the women plant it like this, the men plant it like this, so that metaphorically, if it turns on its side, you get a piece of cloth. And they were in a circle because what had happened is a FARC had stalked us and they were trying to kidnap us. So we had to abandon our film crew. We gave the cameras to someone we had trained in cinematography from the Wiwa. And these are the actual sentinels that night watching out for the FARC. And we escaped that night uh, over the mountains and came down. And it turned out to be just an unbelievable firefight between the Colombian army and the FARC. But that didn't keep us from doing our mission. We went down to the sea, and we uh, found our way to the sacred sites. And even though today those sacred sites can be covered by the city of Santa Marta, it doesn't keep the mamos from praying every day for our collective well-being. And it's astonishing to think that two hours from Miami Beach, you have this pre-Columbian civilization alive and intact, looking down on the very beaches where Columbus's men arrived on the third journey. And there they are, still doing their, their thing. As Mamo Camilo, I was with him a week ago, right where this tree is in Catasama, and he said to me uh, a message that I was able to share with President Juan Manuel Santos. He said, Paz no vale nada. Si es solamente una manera en que los varios lados pueden unificarse para mantener una guerra contra la naturaleza, tenemos que hacer paz con todo el mundo. Peace won't matter if it's just an excuse to, for the three sides of the conflict to come together to maintain a war against nature. We have to make peace with the entire natural world. Well, well anthropology, you know, anthropology is sometimes accused of embracing a kind of extreme relativism as if every trait of culture has to be defended because it exists. Nothing could be further from the truth. Anthropology never calls for the elimination of judgment. It calls for the suspension of judgment. So the very ethical decisions that we, and judgments that we have to make can be informed ones. And the anthropological lens is most usefully shone upon cultural practices of which we know nothing but about which we cast judgments. And there's no greater example than African religion. Were I to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, whatever, there's always one continent left out, Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, voodoo is not a black magic cult. The word voodoo is a fallen word from Dahomey that just means spirit or God. Voodoo is, in fact, the quintessentially democratic faith because the believer has direct access to the divine through spirit possession. Haitians used to say to me, white people go to church and speak about God. Indians eat their magic plants and speak to God. We dance in the temple and become God. And the essence of the faith is the idea that the human being can invoke the deity. The deity mounts the human being. And for that splendid moment of possession, human being and God become 
one and the same. And that's why you see these theatrical gestures cutting into the body to show the power of faith. Or more profoundly, voodoo acolytes in Haiti in a state of trance, handling burning embers with absolute impunity, an astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. So I ask you, where did we get this idea of voodoo being a black magical cult? Well, first of all, Haiti launched the only successful slave revolt in history. For 100 years, it was the only independent black nation. It bought shipments of slaves destined for the American slave market, gave them freedom in Haiti. It funded Simon Bolivar on the condition he freed the slaves in Grand Colombia. And then in the 19 teens, the US Marine Corps occupied Haiti and remained for 20 years, largely in the era of Jim Crow. Most of the Marines from the South, from the era of segregation, everybody above the rank of sergeant got a book contract. The books had names like Black Baghdad, Cannibal Cousin, Voodoo Fire in Haiti, The White King of Lagunav, The Magic Island. Uh, there were dozens of these books, all filled with children bred for the cauldron, pins and needles and voodoo dolls that don't exist, and of course, zombies crawling out of the grave to attack people. They gave rise to the RKO movies of the 40s, Night of the Living Dead, Zombies on Broadway, Zombies Slaves. What, and they essentially said to the American people during the era of Jim Crow that any country where such abominations could happen could only find its redemption through military occupation. That's where we began to think of voodoo as being something bad. Well, I wrote a book on, two books on voodoo. I, I studied, uh, you know, Harvard's a great place, and uh, my professor was a wizard, and uh, he would call me to his fourth floor eerie with these strange assignments. In 1982, he called me up, and he just said, well, ask me if I was interested in going down to Haiti, infiltrate the secret societies, and secure the formula of a folk poison used to make zombies. Well, of course, I said yes, and I had no idea that this, like, what I thought would be a lark would consume four years of my life, and I became the first outsider ever initiated into the Bizango Champoil, the secret societies which were the fountain to which Francois Duvalier went to make the Tonto Makut. That's another story, but I wrote a book called The Serpent and the Rainbow that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. And um, Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you start off in Arizona, drive to the California line, throw your book over, and then go back to Tucson and have a drink. Uh, I didn't exactly do that. I, I disappeared in the forest of Borneo. And you know, we have this idea that these cultures are somehow delicate and frail, as if they're, you know, quaint and colorful but destined to fade away, you know. Nothing could be further from the truth. Change is no threat to culture. Technology is absolutely no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples, not fading away, but being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's what drew me to the forest of Borneo. I wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. I wanted to live with a nomadic people in the heart of the rainforest. And nomadic peoples are profoundly different. Think about it. How do you measure wealth in a community where there is no incentive to accumulate anything? In fact, there's a disincentive. Wealth is defined explicitly as a strength of social relations between people, because if those relations fray, everybody suffers. You know, if I'm a, 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 I have a, a two brother-in-laws and myself with our family group, and if I don't get along with a brother-in-law and I split off with my nuclear family, it means my children have a two-thirds less chance of eating that night. So there's a tremendous emphasis on solidarity. Uh, there is no word for thank you or, or, or sharing in the language because everything is automatically shared. No one knows who will bring the food to the table that night. I once gave a cigarette to a little old lady in an encampment, and I watched as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably across the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And in these communities that are oral traditions, they have a kind of relationship with the natural world. Uh, I've seen this with the Haida, with the Inuit. Uh, so that the flight of a hornbill becomes like a kind of curse of script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. In the same way that you can hear the voices of a character when you read a Victorian novel, they hear the voices of animals. And there's an ongoing dialogue which becomes significant to them. Unfortunately, by the time I got to Sarawak in the late 1980s, 
the sound of the forest has become the sound of machinery, the highest rate of tropical deforestation on Earth. At a time when Brazil was producing 1.3% of the tropical log exports of the world, Malaysia was producing 45%, most of it from the homeland of the Penan. So a way of life morally inspired, inherently right, was exposed and destroyed within a generation. Rivers that once ran clear became so laden with silt it seemed like half of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Seas where the empty freighters hung on the horizon to fill their holds with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Women reduced to prostitution, servitude in the logging camps, children suffering diseases they had never known, men humiliated and standing up, blowpipes against bulldozers, this quixotic resistance that shut down logging for a year electrified the global environmental community, but in the end was no match for the power of the Mal Malaysian state. So today there is no more Penang living as they did in the forest, just as the forests themselves no longer stand, a way of life utterly exhausted. And that, that kind of industrial intrusion, to, to kind of imagine another possibility, let's go for a moment to a civilization that is more diametrically opposed to what we are than you can ever imagine. That brings us to the deserts of Australia, the most parsimonious continent on earth, 10,000 clan territories. And when the British arrived in Australia, they met a people that looked strange, a simple material technology, but what really offended the British is that the Aboriginal people had no interest in improving upon their lot. Now, improving on, upon the lot, progress was a very ethos of Victorian Europe at the time. It was an idea that died in the blood and mud of Flanders of the Great War, but was very much alive during the settlement of Australia. So when the British encountered this completely different worldview, in their inimitable way, they reacted, and they began to kill people. And as recently as... 1902, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aborigines were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, when I was a little boy, farmers in Australia had quotas as to how many abos could be shot with impunity for trespass upon their ranches. As recently as the 1960s, a school book used in schools across Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia, listed the Aborigines as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife of the country. And what was going on was a devotional philosophy beyond the reach of the European mind, and that was a dreaming. The dreaming wasn't a dream. It's the idea that the world at your feet both exists and is eternally waiting to be born. The entire purpose of life in Australia was the antithesis of progress. It was stasis. The goal of life was to do the ritual gestures within your clan territory Along the song lines, which are the trajectories that crisscross the whole continent, these were the lines walked by the ancestors of the dawn of time when they sang the universe into being. This is where the body of the rainbow serpent lay. The idea was you did the ritual gestures along the song line as it traversed your clan territory. The rituals deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. It's like if all European thought had gone into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now, the interesting thing is not to say who's right or who's wrong. If human beings had followed this intellectual tradition, yes, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon. But on the, on, on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and threats to the biological life support systems of the planet. Well, if, if the threat can be industrial, the greater threat is always ideological. If you go into the mountains of Tibet, you'll begin to understand what it meant when Mao Zedong, incidentally, the man responsible for the murder of more of his own people than Hitler and Stalin combined, famously remarked to the 14th Dalai Lama that all religion was poison. The Tibetans knew what to expect. And when the jackboot of the Red Guard landed at last to stay in Lhasa in 1959. 1.2 million Tibetans were killed for the religious faith. 6,000 temples were blasted apart to riprap and dust. And what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists of Beijing? It's all distilled in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negation. He meant that shit happens. 
The second of the noble truths is the cause of suffering is ignorance. By that, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the cruel tendency of human beings to cling to the illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths is the realization, the revelation, that ignorance can be overcome. And the fourth and the most consequential is the delineation of a contemplative practice that if followed has not only the promise but the certainty based on 2,500 years of empirical evidence of a transformation of the human heart as a certain outcome. So we wanted to make a film that we called the Buddhist science of the mind because what is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Buddhism but 2,500 years of empirical observation as to the nature of mind? And so we returned to Tibet on this journey and I was so fortunate to be able to travel. I don't know if you know this guy, Matthew Ricard. Like to be with him in the Himalaya was like to be with Friar Tuck in Sherwood Forest. His father was the greatest French Descartian philosopher. He was raised in a home of luminaries. He learned piano from Stravinsky, photography from Henri Cartier-Bresson. He learned anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. He himself was a molecular biologist in the lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute. One day, when one day he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness, and so he went back to where he had always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. And with us was Shira Barma, a traditional Tibetan Amshi doctor, seen here rather quizzically examining my urine sample. He used to do these pulse diagnoses with me, and he'd put his fingers like this, and all he goes <laughs> for about three hours. But our goal here was to, to meet a bodhisattva, a true Eastern hero. We had heard this story through Trusa Grimpache, the head of the Phupan Sholin Monastery, head of the Nyingma tradition, of a young girl who had been so beautiful as a child that she had been betrothed against her desire by her impoverished family to a wealthy merchant. In her youth, she escaped his clutches by flinging herself into a human latrine. And covered with excrement, she turned up at the gates of the Timboche Monastery in Solokumbu in Nepal. The monks cleaned her up and dispatched her across the 20,000-foot Nangpala Pass into Tibet, where she became ordained as a Tibetan nun, and then crossed back over the pass in the ice and the snow and the winter cold, and went into lifelong retreat as what's called a Sapaani. And for 45 years, she had lived in a single cell, dedicating her entire sentient existence to the recitation of a single mantra. And because because, because Sherab was treating her, we were able to go and meet her. And so we began at this monastery that clings like a swallow's nest to the hills of Nepal and made our way from the Mani Rindu ceremony, which in 18 days celebrates the arrival of the Tibetan Dharma in Tibet in the ninth century. And then we made our way up to the flanks of Everest, not in the shadow of the Western hero who climbs into the reaches of Mount Everest on the stone and cold uh, ice and, and cold, obliterating their consciousness to get to the top of the mountain, risking their lives just to st stand on a pile of rock, which from the Buddhist point of view is just about the stupidest thing you can do with a precious incarnation. No, we were going to find an Eastern hero. And en route, we passed the cave where during his seven years of medical training, sheriffs spent one full year in solitary relief, uh, uh, retreat, and meditation. And as Mathieu would chant the sutras, we came closer and closer to this moment. And this photograph was taken when sunlight fell on the face of this woman for the first time in 45 years. And by the terms of reference of our way of thinking, she should have been mad. But the face that opened to us radiated loving compassion. And Mathieu said, this is the evidence of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And later that night, as we left the uh, Annie to her devotions, a lama at an adjacent monastery said to me, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And, and that leaves it to us to ask why we continue to tolerate the wrath of China that is trying to sweep away this ancient civilization 
that has brought such good things to the world. So we're left at the end with a kind of question. What kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of monotony or a polychromatic world of diversity? Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, another disciple of Franz Boas, said that her greatest fear was that as we drifted towards a kind of monochromatic world of, of, of singularity, not only would the entire range of the human imagination be reduced to a more narrow modality of thought, but we'd wake one day from a dream having forgotten that there are other possibilities for life itself. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern. It's the rights of independent people to choose their own destiny. It's not about freezing people in time like some kind of zoological specimen. It's how can we find a way that all people benefit from the genius of modernity, be it allopathic medicine, science, technology, but critically without that engagement demanding the death of the ethnicity. And the reason that's so important is culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. It's not the songs we sing, the costumes we wear. Ultimately, culture in every community is about a body of moral and ethical values that we collectively put around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within all of us. It is culture alone that allows us to make sense out of sensation, find order and meaning in the universe. Do what Lincoln said, seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when the constraints of culture are lost, when individuals through coercion or volition turn their backs on tradition, seeking perhaps to acquire a level of affluence that is often beyond them as they land again on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere, you simply have to look at the points of chaos and desperation around the world. The Genocide Museum in Kigali in Rwanda. Happily, nation states are beginning to understand that indigenous people don't compromise the nation state, they enrich it if the state is prepared to accept diversity. I'm from Canada. When the British first arrived in the Arctic, the British took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong. But what the British failed to understand <clears throat> was that there's no better measure of genius than the ability to survive in a harsh environment on a technology that had no wood and was limited to what you could carve from bone, slate, stone, and small bits of flotsam that swept up from the sea. The Inuit didn't fear the cold. They took advantage of it. The runners of their sleds were made of fish. Peter Freuchen always quipped that the great thing about Inuit in, um, uh, kamatik, or sled, was you could eat it if you ran out of food. The, the sleds were made of frozen walrus meat and fish. And the Inuit, again, didn't fear the cold. They took advantage of it. This is a photograph I took 200 miles from Iglulik, uh, where polar bear hunting. The temperature that night was minus 65 Celsius when the kamatik ran over in the ice, ripped apart our skidoo, and shattered the foot of our young driver. And the Inuit simply made an igloo and got on with life itself. Blood on ice in the Arctic, despite what Greenpeace tells you, is not a sign of death. It's an affirmation of life itself. And I'll end with one story before I end with one more story. Um, when I was narwhal hunting at the tip of Baffin Island with this community from Arctic, uh, uh, um, uh, village, Olayak, the man on the right, and his wife, the late, she would passed away, Martha, told me a story from the 1950s, a dark period in Canadian history when we forced the Inuit in the settlement to establish our sovereignty in an archipelago that could have gone back to the Europeans or to the Americans, heaven forbid. And um, the, the, this old man, the grandfather of Olayak, refused to go into the settlement. So the family, fearful for his life, took away all of his tools and weapons, thinking that would oblige him to settle in the settlement. Instead, the old man slipped out of the igloo in the middle of the Arctic night in the darkness, pulled down his trousers, and defecated into his hand. And as the feces froze, he shaped into the form of an implement, an implant known to the Inuit as a shit knife. And as it froze, he used it to butcher a dog. He skinned the dog, improvises the traces of a sled from the skin of the dead dog, improvised a sled from the ribcage of the dead dog, harnessed up an adjacent living dog, and shit knife and belt disappeared in the Arctic night. Now talk about getting by with nothing. And this is a symbol of the cultural survival of the Inuit people, this ability 
that of course now is being compromised by something beyond their control. This is a photograph I took in the northernmost community in the world, Kanak in Northwest uh, Greenland. The ice used to come in in September and stay till July. Now it comes in November and is gone by March. So the world of the Inuit is literally melting from beneath them. And one final story. In the wake of 9-11, I wanted to tell a story of Islam for obvious reasons. And so I traveled to the ancient intellectual capital of uh, West Africa, a kind of a port on the southern shore of the Sea of the Sand that is Western Sahara, Timbuktu. And of course, Timbuktu, Damascus, and Baghdad, and Cairo were the great centers of Islamic learning. And in fact, we only, we only were able, the only reason that the genius of the Greek the ancient Greeks survived to inspire the Renaissance is because it was held in trust, in a sense, a sacred repository by Islamic scholars at places like Timbuktu. And even today, you can hold in your hand uh, manuscripts written in the 9th and 10th century in Boston gold dedicated to the highest levels of intellectual endeavor at the height of the Islamic experience, you know, astronomy, scientific, uh, mathematics, science, botany, it's extraordinary. And we went to Timbuktu and then we wanted to go north of there a thousand miles to an ancient salt mine. Now remember that until the discovery of the New World, two thirds of gold came from West Africa overland 52 days from Timbuktu to Marrakesh. And that was the route that we retraced. And we went to this ancient salt mine and it was a kind of extraordinary because it was during the Torah rebellion. So there was a lot of battles going on all around. And we eventually made our way to this ancient mine. And I, I don't even know who these people were. We kept picking them up like, like a dog picks up uh, something. I mean, and I don't know who they were. They were just there to protect us. But it was so beautiful. You know, as they sat five times a day in the absence of water, cleansing their hands with sand and praying towards Mecca, we finally got to the salt mine in this poor friend of mine, Issa Muhammad, took one look at this medieval scene, and he said, I would not bring my wife here. And I asked some of the smugglers, you know, where they came from. They said, there are no countries here. And in the course of that uh, visit, this salt, incidentally, is not a condiment. It traded at one time ounce for ounce with gold in this traffic from West Africa. And I met this man who chronologically was younger than me, but his body was utterly broken. He lived in a hut of blocks of salt. He had one rusted barrel with brackish water. His entire possessions were a ragged vermouth that he wore day and night. He had been caught in a system of debt peonage. He had borrowed money from a merchant to save the life of his child, and he had never been able to repay that debt. And he'd been at the mine nonstop. The only man who stayed at the mine, even in the summer when they say the sun can practically melt the sand. And when I looked at his debt, his debt in total, and I calculated that given his production of salt, he would never escape that debt. And yet his total debt was less than a meal for four here on Whidbey Island. So I gave him the money, and he blessed Allah, and a sandstorm just swept through the encampment and enveloped him in a kind of cloud of yellow haze. I never found out if he was telling me the truth. Did he get back to his family? Was he killed for the money? All I can remember is this blessing from Allah that came out of this sandstorm. And then as we made our way back to Timbuktu, we ran into a caravan that had been forced to stop in the middle of the desert because a rainstorm had landed upon them. And if the salt gets wet, it breaks and loses all value. So here were seven young men, all the camels of their family, all their, all their wealth, all the salt. They were 250 miles from a well, and they were down to one liter of water when we came upon them. They had sent, I took this photograph as we arrived, they had sent this one lad off to the desert where they thought they could walk 25 miles, and there might be a depression where they could dig and maybe get some water. Now, in the Sahara, you can live for two weeks with no food. Without water, death comes in an evening. The truck drivers famously say that the great thing about brake fluid is it keeps you off the battery acid. And so as we came upon these people, what was the very first thing they did? 
they began to kindle with a twig fire and brewed us with their last liter of water, a welcoming tea. Honoring the adage of the Bedouin that you will kill the last goat that keeps your children alive to feed the wandering stranger who comes in out of the night cold, hungry, in need of help, because you never know when you will be that person coming in through the desert night, desperately in need of help. And as I watched Muhammad pour me this first cup of tea, I thought to myself, these are the moments that allow us as human beings to hope. And this is why for 50 years, I've been running around this beautiful planet, embracing the wonder of culture and the glory of the human spirit as brought into being by all of us. Thanks very much. You're too old to have to get up. You should just. Talk about taking a trip around the world in less than an hour. Um, I, I have to say there's so many things to be wowed by, but one of the ones I can't get over is he didn't take one sip of water <laughs> with all that talking. <laughs> so thank you for these fascinating insights um, from people and places many of us will never have a chance to visit. And I think that the title of your talk, that Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World, could not be more relevant than ever right now. So um, we're going to take a minute to collect any questions that you've written down on your little white pieces of paper. OK, great. We've got some people that will be working the aisles and the rows to collect those. And while they're doing that, and before Wade gets the mic again, um, I just wanted to say that this is the moment that we ask you to consider a gift to the Trudy Sundberg Lectures. Our goal every year is to continue to bring vibrant speakers free to the community. And although we think it's very important to offer the lectures free, they are definitely not free to put on. It takes a lot of work by a lot of people year round. To keep them free, we rely on donations from our business sponsors, from the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation, from generous donors like you, and from our anonymous donors. It makes a world of difference, and because our planning committee are all volunteers, you need to know that every penny is stretched and no donation is too small. So there will be envelopes in the lobby on your way out, and remember that QR code on the program you can also use to make a donation. So now I have to put my glasses on because some of these are written in very small font. Contrasting Western acquisitiveness with native cultures, how likely do you think it is that there is a genetic basis for contentment versus a lack? A genetic basis for contentment. I don't think there's any genetic base. You know, culture is just comes out of the imagination, and it, you know, it's not like there are good cultures and bad cultures. The whole point is to sort of embrace the wonder of, of, of what makes us all great. I mean, I, I never speak about the genius of my own tradition. I mean, I, I exult in it. I mean, allopathic medicine is the greatest single achievement in the history of humanity, without any doubt. Every one of us in this room would have been dead 100 years ago from one thing or another. So it's not about in any way denigrating who we are in our tradition. It's just simply pointing out the obvious, that our way is just one way. And that um, you know, when I'm often asked you know, why, why these cultures matter, I often respond with two words, climate change, not to suggest that we go back to a pre-industrial past, but rather to suggest that the very existence of all these diverse ways of thinking by definition, puts a lie to those of us in our own tradition who say that we cannot change, as we all know we must change, something about our fundamental way of the way we interact with the planet. 
I'm an eternal optimist. I, 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 uh, I absolutely believe that humanity is going to find its way through the climate crisis. I think some of the climate hysteria is counterproductive. I write about it. But I have complete faith in human beings to move forward. I mean, you know, pessimism is an indulgence. Um, um, uh, you know, um, a kind of um, orthodoxy, the enemy of invention. Um, is we just have to do what needs to be done and only then ask whether it was possible or possible or plausible, you know, acceptable. I think everything will be fine. Okay, this one you're going to like talking about. I understand that you were once in a situation where you had to set yourself on fire. Oh. Would you care to elaborate? Well, you know, you have to do things sometimes. <laughs> um, and um, what had happened is um, I was in uh, Haiti. And, uh, you know, the, the, the reputation of the Bizango Champel was pretty dire. Uh, and my main informant was an emperor of the society. And he had been in charge of the Tonton Makut for Francois Duvalier during the original regime, right? And the Tonton Makut took its name, Tonton's uncle, Makut, shoulder bag. If you misbehave, they took you away, right? And I once asked Erard uh, if during the revolution he had, he had killed anyone. And he said, I never killed any people, just enemies. And, uh, uh, and so I, when I wanted to study the Bizango, the reason for this is that we, we found a drug that could make someone appear to be dead. We found an individual who clearly had been misdiagnosed as dead. We were quite clear that he had been punished by these societies. And we knew that in Equatorial West Africa, secret societies were the most powerful arbiter of social and political life. And they had tribunals and executive functions and judicial functions. And they punished people by the use of poisons. And we knew the incredible continuity between Haiti and West Africa. Remember critically that the Haitian colony was the richest colony on, on, in the world, right? Uh, two thirds of the world's coffee crop, uh, 163 million pounds of sugar, 4,000 ships that sailed between Port-au-Prince and Europe, 5 million of the 21 million people of the Ancien Regime of France depended on that trade. It was a jewel of the imperial age. And it all came to a crashing halt with the only successful slave revolt in history that began at a voodoo ceremony. And, and so critically, at the time of the revolution, the colony had been expanding as never before. And so because of the attrition on the plantations, 19,000 slaves died every year. So in the last decade, as many as 300,000 Africans were brought into the colony when suddenly a blanket of isolation came down on the colony. And don't forget that the colony had to fight off all the imperial powers. The British lost more men trying to take the emergent country of Haiti than Wellington lost in the, in the Peninsular campaigns. Napoleon, at the height of his power, sent his own brother-in-law, Leclerc, with the biggest military force ever to sail from France. It was to do two things, quell the noxious slave revolt in Haiti, proceed to New Orleans, go up the Mississippi, hem in the expanding 13 colonies, and reestablish French dominance in a continent that only 30 years before the Treaty of Paris had become British North America. Now, needless to say, if it hadn't been for the revolutionary slaves of Haiti, you'd all be speaking French west of the Mississippi, right? But that force was totally annihilated in Haiti. So the, so the interesting thing is Haiti became this pariah, this complete exception. The Catholic Church wasn't there. A complete blanket of isolation came down upon the island. And so the peasantry grew literally out of stock in Africa. I've, there's a liturgical language in voodoo called langage. I've been with Yoruba scholars at voodoo ceremonies. And the priests don't know what they're saying. It's like Latin for a Catholic priest in the old days. But the Yoruba guys have picked up entire phrases of Yoruba. So critically, you know, whereas a place like Jamaica was a British colony until 1963, with all that that implied, Haiti was an independent country in 1804. So in many ways, it's more African than Africa, because during the 19th century, when European capital, like Inca and Blotter, went all through Equatorial West Africa, disrupting traditional structures, Haiti was alone. So when we found out about these secret societies, it suddenly made sense that 
the zombification was a form of capital punishment by these societies. And to figure if that, that was true, I had to become initiated into these societies, and no outsider had ever done that. In fact, when I wrote the NSF and applied for the money to do that, I got the money, but the anonymous academic reviewers literally wrote on the form, Davis must be told if he tries to do this, he'll get killed. Well, I didn't think that was true, or I wouldn't have done it, but they were pretty heavy duty. And um, you know, 4,000 people in red and black robes with the sacred coffin in the night with the torches and the dirge-like anthems and everybody terrified. And so anyway, uh, there was a voodoo priest who had been described by the BBC as the incarnation of evil. He wasn't, he was just a great guy. And um, his name was Marcel Pierre, but he also had a brothel. And that's where I first got the poison. And uh, one of the poisons. And uh, his wife was dying of uterine cancer. And by this point, we were very good friends. And he was crying on my shoulder. And I'd been buying her blood at the corrupt Red Cross clinic controlled by Baby Doc. And um, this one day, I took him back to this crossroads. And I, and I, I got a flat tire just as I put him on the tap tap. And for once, I looked just like an American tourist, t-shirt pants, no wallet, got a flat tire by the side of the road. And I said to the guys, I manually fixed tire, I said, fix my tire, please. And as they're starting to do it, I said, Pogin Kop, I've got no money. And they said, Qui calete mon saillot? Which means, what kind of white are you? You got no money. And then they started hassling me, right? And normally I shouldn't have done it, but I was so in such a foul mood that when the guy started grabbing my arm, my watch and everything, I grabbed his hand and I gave him the Secret Society handshake. And then he blanched back like that. And then he said, qui calete bon sayo? And then we had a big laugh. And then he said, ah, new grand, new grand, new grand, grow back I swear. And by chance, I had broken down right beside a big Secret Society temple, just below the road. So that night, I went back. And for the only time ever, I went to a Secret Society gathering unescorted by a powerful voodoo priest who knew me. So everything's cool, and it begins like a voodoo ceremony, the salutation for leg by the spirit of communication. But then at midnight, the drum beats change to what's called Petro Sauvage. You hear the whip crack of the symbol of, the, of slavery and the conch trumpet blow, the symbol of the revolution. And the order goes out, soldats de nuit changez peau. Soldiers of the night change skins. And everybody goes into the inner sanctum and emerges in these anonymous red and black KKK-like robes, right? And the whole dynamic shifts. And uh, at that point, uh, four men came over and dragged me and flung me into a dark chamber. And I rolled over in the dust. And I looked up, and there was a whole tribunal of presidents and emperors of the society. And they wanted to know how much I knew and how I knew it and why I knew it. And what I knew was both too much and too little. And it was a very awkward moment, um, to say the least. And, um, but there's always a human skull with a candle on top of it at the base of the potomiton, which is how the spirits arrive. And there's always a bottle of raw sugarcane liquor, which is not drunk, but used as a libation. And I just, I knew, I, knew I, I had to do something. So I just calmly went over to the liquor, and I went up and I poured it all over my body and then very deliberately put my hands in the candle on top of the human skull and lit myself on fire. And then I moved quickly to the men and offered them the handshake with my whole body ablaze. And they just loved it. And, um, and, and they cracked up laughing. And after that, I couldn't go by that crossroads without being waved down. Waj, Waj. They called me Waj. because Waj, you know, we got something happening tonight. But that was just a bit of theater. Yeah. No big deal. It's like Keep when you light, you know, I mean, honestly, it's like how many, who hasn't put lighter fluid on your finger when you're a little boy? Well, on you know, your little yeah. finger is one thing, yeah. dousing your whole body is another. <clears throat> okay, Wade, what advice would you give to a child who wants to, who wants to someday explore the world? Well, Jim Whitaker, who's a great American, the first American to, uh, climb Everest is the greatest thing for young people. It said, when you're young, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. And for young people, I always say creativity is not the motivation of action. It's a consequence of action. If you don't do, you don't create. And 
I really believe that young people should be opportunists, not in terms of being schemers, but you've got to put yourself in the way of opportunities where there's no choice but su success, and you suddenly find yourself capable of doing stuff that would have been unimaginable to you a few short months before. You know, a career is not something you take on like a cloak. It's something that builds around you, act by act, decision by decision, moment by moment. You know, I think, uh, uh, I really do believe that, you know, pessimism is an indulgent despair and insult to the imagination. Orthodox is the enemy of invention. Do what needs to be done. I've never seen a rule I didn't want to break. I actually haven't seen a rule I didn't break. Uh, uh, you know, I, and the other thing is when I was young, you know, I, I came from a very modest middle class background. And, uh, you know, in a world that, you know, I, I definitely had Baudelaire's malady, horror of home. I mean, I had to get away from that suburb or I was going to die. And I learned very early to jump over cliffs. And I only had one word in my vocabulary for new experience, and that was yes. And I think that young kids today sort of are brought up in this world where they all do programs. You know, they don't do anything on their own. They, you know, there's a program to build a church in Guatemala, and then they do something, a program there, and a program there, and a program there. We didn't have that. We just did it. I mean, uh, people said, how did you first go to the Amazon and collect plants? Well, you call up a travel agent, get a plane, <laughs> and land in Bogota and see what happens. Uh, you know, and I, that's just how I, I did it. I never... Um, I never planned anything, and uh, and one thing I always say to young people is that uh, you know it takes time and parents. It takes time to build something that's never been seen before. The wonder and uniqueness of a of a human life. You know, uh, I always say to young people, you know, be patient. Give your destiny time to find you. The greatest creative challenge in life is the challenge to be the architect of your own life. Invariably, all of you are old enough to know. The bitterness comes to those in old age who look back on the life of decisions imposed upon them. And if you've made your own decisions, you may not have made all the right ones, but if you've owned them, you can never worry about it, and, and you live content. Uh, and and uh, the other thing I say to young people, don't expect to win. You know, we, even in a, a spiritual sense, you know, we, we, like we have this idea in Christianity, there's a fallen archangel who is a devil and the Christ child, and we try to put them together with the hope that good will triumph over evil, but it ain't going to happen. And my father used to always say, there's good and evil in the world, son. Take your pick and get on with it. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. The, if you ask the obvious question in Europe in the Middle Ages, if God's all-powerful, why does he accept evil in the universe? You were burned at the stake, right? But when Lord Krishna was asked that very question, if God's all-powerful, why does he love evil in the universe? Lord Krishna said, to thicken the plot. In other words, that's how life is, right? And the Buddhists are really cool that way. They, 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 you know, they see life not as a destination, but as a path. You know? And the goal of life is not to win, it's to liberate, you know, to reveal your Buddhist nature. And I've taken that to heart in terms of... Uh, I don't ever expect to win anything, and so I'm never disappointed. And because of that, I really retain the same idealism I had when I was 20, the same zest for life. You know, I work harder than anyone you've ever met. I, mean, I work so hard, you can't even believe it. I once went 12 years without taking a day off. Not a day off, you know, but my work is my life, so what the hell? And, uh, but I, you know, I've never, I've never done what people expect. I just, I don't know how, I just never paid attention. And, and it wasn't always easy, but, and sometimes, you know, you get weak. Like, it's a funny story. When I was 23, my poor father, my father spent half his savings to send me to college, not his, his income, knowing that every day I was there widened the gap between us, right? And then when I, after two years in the Amazon, I was this precocious botanical explorer, 23 years old, and what do I do? I go work in a Haida Gwaii, toughest logging camp on the coast of B.C., and my poor father is thinking, what have I spent all this money at Harvard for? And, and he never questioned it. Um, but, but then I didn't know what to do, so I applied to law school and bot graduate school and botany at Harvard as if they were the same thing. And I got into both, and then the, uh, the miracle happened, the fairy godmother. My sister was articling at this really snobby law firm in Vancouver. And I went to pick her up one day, and the receptionist was this wonderful old lady. And she said to me, are you Karen's brother? And I said, yeah. 
you just came back from the Amazon. Uh, you eat these weird plants. And I said, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. You follow me. And she took me back to the law library, and she'd set up a ladder that rose to a lithograph of an English solicitor from the 17th century with a big hooked nose, a big belly, the wig, the whole thing. She made me climb up there until I came face to face, and then she yelled up at me, is that you? And I looked, and I screamed, no. And I came down off the ladder, went to her front desk, called the law school, retracted my application, and went off to Harvard to graduate school in botany. You know, I almost, I almost blew it in a moment of weakness. I should say happily that my father lived just long enough to see my first book published. He died of a heart attack with the review of my first book in his pocket, not in the New York Times, no, in the real newspaper of record, the Victoria Daily Colonist. This is, this is what counted. Anyway. So. OK, next. We're sitting across from a wonderful Whidbey Island institution called the Healing Circles. Mr. Davis, what does healing mean to you environmentally, politically, and personally? Well, healing comes from the same Anglo-Saxon root, hail, meaning whole, holy, and, and oneness, right? That's what healing is all about. And I, you know, I often say that the most important healing we need to do is with the natural world. And when, I, when you talk about this psychedelic revitalization, I think it's been, to a great extent, overhyped in a way. Uh, but I do think certain psychedelics are very useful for couples therapy, post-traumatic stress, uh, perhaps end-of-life care, not to make us unafraid of death, but maybe come to terms with the imminent and inexorable nature of death. But the real healing we have to do is with the natural world. And that's where I think psychedelics can be really helpful, because you can't take San Pedro cactus and not come away with a deeper appreciation of the natural world. And um, you know, I always say, it's interesting, if you look back on my lifetime, you know, when we were kids, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of the car window was a great environmental victory. No one talked about the biosphere. Now those terms are part of the language of children, right? And when we look at our lives, whenever we get pessimistic, we should remember that in our lifetimes, women have gone from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the closet to the altar. And what's not to love about a world capable of those kind of progressive transformations? But, but, but the one ingredient in that recipe of social change that we expunged from the record is that millions of us took psychedelics and they prostrate before the gates of awe. I wouldn't write the way I write. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't have understood cultural relativism. I wouldn't treat women the way I treat women. I wouldn't understand homosexuality. I wouldn't do a lot of things if I had taken psychedelics. And like Bill Clinton, I took psychedelics and I'm grateful that I did. But get the message, as George Harrison said, and hang up. Honestly, that's really important. You know, psychedelics are great, but they, they've got not much to teach you after the first couple of experiences, right? Like Ram Dass said, get the message, hang up. Okay, some of the time, I don't even understand the question, but I guess that's why we're all here to learn, right? What would you change, uh, how would you change Western education to address the ethos sphere, and what is the relevance of the axial age to religious and cultural intolerance? Well, I have no idea what the second part of the question is. But, <laughs> Me either. Um, but education, I mean, I really think this idea of, um, you know, um, isn't funny. You would never graduate someone from Princeton who didn't know the difference between photography and painting, would you? Um, and yet we graduate people all the time who don't know the formula of photosynthesis. No politician should be able to run who can't recite that formula of life. You know, the, the, the simplest thing, that carbon dioxide with water sparked by photons of light creates the food we eat and the air we breathe. If you don't know that formula, you shouldn't be able to run for elective office. And the first time I learned that form, I was very lucky. I didn't take a biology course in my life until third year of university and I ended up getting a PhD in biology. And the night that I figured out photosynthesis, the whole metabolic pathways, at the side, remember the Science Museum at Harvard, remember? 
I was in that science museum. I got thrown out by security. I was so blown away by the Krebs cycle and photosynthesis that I went nuts. I started running around to the other students and shaking them and saying, do you know what this is? And I think I'm the only student who ever got escorted out of the science library because it just, it just blew my mind, right? And I thought, the main, the main thing I thought was, oh my God, what if I had missed this? What if I had gone through college and not understood biology? How can we allow that to happen, right? And, 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 and I, I think you know, we have to turn students on to the wonder of life, and, and that is biology. You know, that's why people like Ed Wilson were such incredible Americans. You know, I mean, that nobody's done more for, for the good of the world than Professor Wilson, who died, as you know, what, the day before Christmas, or it was the day of Christmas, you know. Uh, but, but uh, you know, there, there was this book in the 70s called The Secret Life of Plants. Now, actually, we've learned from people like Suzanne Simar that, that plants actually do some pretty cool messaging chemically and everything. But at that time, most of the secret life of plants was kind of mail order mystic hippie ethnography crap. And, um, and you know, there was a book that said plants like Mozart and they like human touch. And my friend Tim Plowman, great botanist, great musician, great poet, hated that book. And he used to say to me, why would a plant give a shit about Mozart? And, 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 and even if it did, why should that impress us? They can eat light. Isn't that enough? You know? <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, Wade, if you could recommend one book that, if followed, would have a tremendous positive impact, what would that book be? Gosh, of course. One of yours, no, of no, course. No, no, no. <laughs> no um, gosh, that's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, probably Thomas Berry, you know, uh, The Dream of the Earth. Dream of the Earth. Do you know that book? Beautiful book. It's a good one. Or any, any book of poetry by Gary Snyder. Yeah. I used to pack a book of uh, Gary Snyder. You know, I, I once, uh, I had this girlfriend, Oedipi. She had run away to Woodstock at 13 and never went home. And she had this hippie van that looked like a Louisiana bordello. And we decided to go see Gary in the, in the, in the California mountains. And it's hard to find him, you know, it's kind of protected. And we kind of pounded our way up and I found him in his garden and immediately spewed apologies for doing just what I had done, completely interrupted him. And I, I was a nobody at that time. And he just said to me, anyone who can find me deserves to be here. A beautiful thing. That's an important thing. I answer every email I get from a kid. I get thousands. Because you, you think that ignoring them is neutral. It's not. It's a slap in the face. They're writing you not because they really are asking the question that's in the email. They want to know if there's somebody. And if you don't answer, you're saying they're nobody. That's the most important thing to do with young people. Always make them feel that they're somebody. And that's what Gary did that day to me. It seems that most or all cultures have their darkness. I am confused how to think about cultural preservation or respect in light of things like female genital mutilation and such practices? What are your thoughts? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, the, the whole point of culture is not to say that we're bad, they're good, or that they're, you know. No, every culture is the whole universe of the human experience. And that's what I said earlier about, you know, an anthropologists never embrace an extreme relativism as if every trait of culture must be defended simply because it exists. Lots of traits of character can end up in the dustbin of history without it meaning the end of who the people are as a culture. Like, for example, a friend of mine, Phil Borges, who's from Seattle, some of you may know him, he's a wonderful photographer. He had a program called Bridges to Understanding where he would give video cameras to young women around the world for them to document what happened to them, good or bad. And there was one woman in, in a very conservative part of the Sudan with a very extreme form of female mutilation who had been really pilloried in her community for being against it, right? And, uh, but Phil got her a camera and she persuaded a young girl who was going through the procedure to allow the procedure to be photographed. And then she walked over with the video camera to the men's circle and showed them what they had actually been doing to their daughters, sisters, wives, and mothers for all of their history. And the practice stopped that day. 
So, you know, change is the one constant. It's not about freezing people in time. It's not about glorifying any particular culture. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about anthropology is not the differences, but the similarities. What I find so interesting is that every single culture faces the same adaptive imperatives. We all, you know, have to bring children into the world. We have to feed our kids. We have to find successful ways to couple that are consistent. We have to deal with the agony of old age, the inexorable mystery and, and separation that death represents. What's fascinating is given that common adaptive imperative is how many remarkable ways we've tried to figure out how to live. I mean, there's an ethnic group in China that has no husbands and no fathers. Now think about that. Okay. That's like a <laughs> quiz for tomorrow. Okay, this will be the last one. Please say a few words from an anthropological perspective on what's happening in the U.S. in the closing of minds into conspiracy theories. Well, I wrote, it's funny, you know, during COVID, I was asked to, uh, everybody wanted me to write about COVID, and I didn't think I had anything to say. And then one day I was kayaking around our little island in BC, Bowen Island, and I had this flash that COVID wasn't a story of health or medicine, that it was a story of culture. And I came back and I wrote uh, 7,000 words that I sent to an old friend of mine, Jan Wenner, who created Rolling Stone. And Jan loved it. And he had a brilliant young female editor that we cut it down to four or 5,000 words and put it up on the website. And it was called The Unraveling of America. And it had 362 million social media impressions around the internet. Five million people read it on the site. It was the biggest article of Rolling Stone for the year, and it won the award for like the top magazine piece in the English language. And it looked at what COVID told us about the state of America. A lot of it was wrong, because it was written in August of 2020, before the election, when Trump was at his sort of most kind of bizarre, and, and, and the possibility of his reelection loomed large. Um, and, and no one at that time could have dreamt that the vaccines could have come. Remember that until COVID, the fastest development of any vaccine was for months. That was four years. I mean, talk about a miracle that the American scientists, uh, the science came up with these mRNA vaccines that are so efficacious. You know, it's incredible. I mean, you know, I, I can't begin, but that article attempted to do that in a way. Well, thank you so much, sure. Wade. It's really been a fabulous <laughs> evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much all for coming, and we hope you'll mark your calendar for May, Saturday, May 6th, here at Wicca next year. We'll have another speaker, and you can check the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation website for updates on the Trudy Lectures throughout the year, and also to find out when um, a recording of Wade's lecture tonight will be posted on that website. Thank you so much for coming.